Some men don't like to be taken for a ride, but that's what you're going to get here for episode 004 of A Review to a Kill, which is a look back on the James Bond film franchise presented to you by fanboysanonymous.com. I'm Tony Mango. I've got with me Callum Wiggins. Anyone for scuba? <laughs> to <Robert> with <laughs> Felice. Been a while, Crocodile. <laughs> we are talking Thunderball for this edition. We, uh, of course, at this point, we've gone through all the way up until Thunderball. So check out those previous episodes beforehand if you want to kind of follow the journey along with us. We had a lot of positive things to say about Goldfinger, some real negative things to say about Goldfinger. I think uh, Thunderball is going to be an interesting one to discuss. Primarily for some of the negatives, it's not the strongest Bond film. It's got a lot of uh, of interesting things that led to the point of it being made. So we're going to do our usual breakdown here of the seven elements. The, the girls, the gadgets, the villains, the allies, the action, the humor, the music, and, you know, some other tidbits of information here and there. I've got notes from watching the film. Uh, not only I've seen it a bunch of times beforehand, but re-watching it and then watching it again with the uh, commentary track on just to get a little bit more information and everything. So um, we're going to bounce around here. We invite you to tell us your thoughts in the comments below. Drop a comment on the YouTube channel in particular. And while you're over there, hit the like button, hit the share button, hit the all the buttons that are good, uh, except for the, you know, the dislike button. Don't hit that one. And hit the subscribe in particular if you have not already. Ring that little notification bell as well. Follow us on the Facebook and Twitter accounts. Check out the Patreon if you want to see more from this. Go to patreon.com slash anonymous and show us some support over there. Even a dollar is greatly appreciated. It helps us grow and helps us do more projects like this in the future. And check out the merchandise shops on TeePublic and Redbubble. There you go. Plugs out of the way. Let's start off with the opening here. We got the opening uh, gun barrel. And... Everything from that point on, I think, is kind of open range to discuss. Uh, we'll we'll talk, I guess, the opening thing after we get through uh, our our initial impressions. Um, without getting too deep into it, what's your your takeaway of Thunderball? Middle of the road. I just I don't know. Like I didn't seemed like it was going to stay with me the way Goldfinger did. and But it wasn't, like, bad, like Dr. No. Dr. No is getting worse as these movies go on. <laughs> uh, best of the four movies by a country mile. Really? Yep, yeah, it's a million times better than Goldfinger. Huh. Okay. You're you're continually surprising me with uh, the ones that you this like. This movie is structured like a fucking movie. It feels <laughs> like the characters are given time to develop. The villain is amazing. I don't want to go into detail of everything, but just this feels like such a better movie than anything that I've seen so far. Wow. Okay, we're gonna disagree on some of this. <laughs> I know. Like the way that you described it to me going into it, I just like thought, and then I saw it was like two hours ten minutes. I thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna take it for a bit of a ride here, and then obviously. And again, we'll talk about certain elements of it, like early on, get maybe a little bit wary. But then everything from just the, after the first sequence onwards, I just felt, yeah, this is a really tell, well told story. I really, <laughs> really enjoyed it. Well, that first sequence is a real jarring way to start off because Bond is dead. It's like, again, <laughs> this is a trope. <laughs> yeah, that, but... was the, that was the weird thing. The, the opening thing did it, threw me off a bit. Uh, that's not even the bad part about it. Is it ends up being Bond's fighting a man in drag. It's filmed so poorly, oh. and that's one of the my the big things I I got to knock this movie for is they keep speeding things up, and it's just this like kind of sh almost like shaky cam before shaky cam was a thing. I hate the opening of this movie. I think the jetpack is ridiculous, even though it's real. Like that's a real jetpack. <laughs> I found it hilarious, hilarious, but like, I don't feel that's like a negative thing. Like, some there needs to be some element of like weird gadget based tomfoolery in Bond movies, in my mind. So, I didn't mind the jetpack, I thought was just it looked ridiculous. And him flying around as fl landing by his car was a bit ridiculous, but I like a little bit of ridiculousness in some of these movies. I thought the jetpack was cool, like, it seems appropriate for Bond and. It's what, what, 65? So it's just their interpretation of 
a jet tack, so of course it's going to be a little cheeky, but the fighting the man in drag was, the fight was shot horribly. I felt like, again, got to relate it to the wrestling thing. It was almost like a Kevin Dunn thing. There were so many like weird, and now we're here, and now we're here, we're here, look here. It It was very hard to get through that first fight sequence, but when he does punch the guy initially i thought of the austin powers <laughs> line that's a mad man it's just like very funny that's probably what they were parodying in particular he yeah. was originally the uh the way that the scene was written he was supposed to kill him by strangling him with his own bra <laughs> and they decided to go in a different direction there i think the bra would have been too comical i like how he throws the flowers i like that part but the jetpack is just... Why does he have a jetpack on the roof of this building? He's to get away. Couldn't he just... Yeah. I don't know, left? No. Like, he's, you, know, like, you no, put a jetpack up there. Vehicle. But yeah, he put I that know. up there. Like, that's so... Like, I hate the way that they, they could have... How do you think he got into the room in the first place? Landed his jetpack on top and got into the room. <laughs> I mean, uh, I know it's ridiculous, but, like, it's, it's, it's a Bond film. It's I'm less just... ridiculous than you're making it out to be. I, I hate like, it. Like fires load of um, like hose towards like oh I hate that too. Water the, the Frenchman afterwards. It's like I hate the whole <laughs> jet the jets uh, the water jets on the car too. Uh, that so is it too cheeky for you? I don't know how after the briefcase of a million things <laughs> this is so far fetched. Really. Well, the briefcase I can understand happening. Like you you just you store a knife in it. Are real jetpacks actually exist. <laughs> It's more so to me why he has it. That's he like, like <laughs> they get you, they get they get access to this sort of like amazing technology. We still the lab thing rat in for this kind of yeah. shit. Like, I think like if you give Bond a jetpack in a different scenario, I'm cool with it. Like, I mean, we eventually we get to a point where he's in space, so it's like, yeah. Well, I, thought, I, I thought the most absurd thing about it is the fact that he just kills the apparently sixth highest ranked person, Inspector, in just a really early opening sequence of the movie. Yeah, that is pretty interesting. It's not just like a mook; it's like number, yeah, like number six or something. Yeah, he's number six. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not. This is one of my least favorite of the opening sequences: the jets on the car, the jetpack, the man in drag. I, I the film. The way that they film it, I'm not a fan of it at all. But I like the theme a lot. Uh, the visuals are kind of meh. It's just silhouettes underwater. It's not the most imaginative, but it's not bad. The lyrics are both great and terrible at the same time. Uh, they don't make any sense whatsoever. And he's mostly talking about Bond here, but, you know, uh, if you take like Thunderball. <laughs> if you take the word ball out of it, it makes perfect sense. He strikes like thunder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 not my favorite theme out of all of them cause just because it's very nonsensical. But I mean, they got Tom Jones to do this, so that's a, that's a pretty big coup, I think, for these movies. I just like the way that it. I, it's one of my favorite ones to actually listen to because it's just a fun theme to actually like sing along to, or whatever. Like he always runs while others walk. Ba-da, ba-da. It's like kind of like. It's got Goldfinger esque vibes to it, but a little bit more sing songy, I think. And I do like some of the lyrics. You know, he acts while other men just talk. Uh, I I like this little part. He looks at this world and wants it all. We're going to reference that in at least two other movies, so they get back to that in a little bit. But the world's but, not enough. Exactly. Yeah, I was say that. That's uh, <laughs> it's in not only the world's not enough, but it's on in another Bond movie. Um, that wasn't originally the theme. Uh, Thunderball. Uh, Tom Jones and this whole Thunderball theme in general, it wasn't really what they were starting off with, which was Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. And that was by Shirley Bassey and some other people have done it in the past too. Um, later on in the movie, there's the the scene where they're dancing and that's called the um, Kiss Kiss Club. That's a reference to that. And you can hear the instrumental version of Kiss, uh, Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. It's like, do, 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 do. It's like kind of like tropical kind of thing. That's Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. And I am not a big fan of that theme because uh, I, I like the the idea behind it. You know, Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, he's going to kiss you, then you're going to get killed and all that other kind of thing. 
But uh, <laughs> it's one of those weird things where Shirley Bassey in particular, the way that she sings it, she tends to say ban, ban instead of bang, bang. And it just always threw me off. Mr. Kiss, kiss, ban, ban. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know? But uh, you hear that throughout the movie, and that's not the only time that we get a Bond theme where the secondary Bond theme is actually the more prominent theme. It happens in Tomorrow Never Dies. It happens in The World's Not Enough, actually. And there's some other ones here and there. But how are you guys feeling about uh, like the visuals or the opening title sequence and overall, like, you know, Tom Jones belting it out and passing out? <laughs> I thought the visuals were pretty good i thought the song was actually great i mean yeah okay strikes like thunderball again just take out the word ball i think we're good it was um uh, one of the better ones i thought at least you're it leaves no room for interpretation that a lot of this movie is going to be underwater <laughs> so, too much so of this at, movie, least I think. It, at least it's it's thematic in that regard I mean, a little bit obviously concerned with some of the limericks of every woman he wants, he'll get. I and mean, his days of asking are all gone. I mean, bit. <laughs> and he's going to confirm that shortly thereafter. <laughs> but he thinks that the fight's worth it all. Yeah. So he strikes. Like thunder. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great if that's how he sings the whole thing. He's like, and he strikes da 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 like thunder. <laughs> um, here's something I'm gonna uh, I dislike here uh, Emilio Largo we're introduced to him by he's opening up a secret door with this giant remote control panel which is really stupid I hate it uh, it's not the worst thing in the franchise but I, that just seemed hokey to me that seemed more parody than actual Bond but I love the Bluefeld conference sequence. Yes. Yeah. This is one of my favorite parts of this movie. They parody the hell out of it in Austin Powers, and they do a great job with it. But um, you know, they're going over the whole uh, number so-and-so. It's talking about this. And they're like, you know, we we planted drugs in this area. That's worth however many thousand. And, um, you know, we're intimidating this person. That's going to go whatever. And it turns out that these two have been working on this other project and this one smug son of a bitch is just sort of you know nothing nothing i gotta report even though he's clearly embezzling some of the funds and bluefeld kills him with this trick electrified chair that goes down and replaces him with an empty chair <laughs> i love it well what i liked was number 11 is terrified he thinks he's going to die and number nine's just like, yeah, that's right. Kill him. He's embezzling. Fuck him. And then number nine just fries. Very good. <laughs> there, there is kind of a an ongoing theme in this movie in general of like villains killing off other villains. It's like there's very much a sign of we're all kind of in it for ourselves, but there's one guy at the top of this organization, but we're not we're not above taking out people from our own ranks if we think that that's threatening our position. Yeah. And that's realistic because they're terrible, evil people. So, yeah, exactly. You know, I love uh, Blofeld's voice. They're like, Blofeld's never better than when he's just a hand and full on Dr. Claw from uh, Inspector Gadget. He's just Indeed. like, number two, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. I forget who does the voice, but it's just great. It's just like, you know, the to the penny number one, whatever. He's just like, you know, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure he didn't say that. But yeah. Yeah, it, deleted scene. <laughs> that actually was different in the original story as well. Uh, it wasn't an embezzling thing. It was supposed to be that he killed uh, number nine because he had raped a girl. And they decided, eh, we don't really want to talk about that. They're okay with that, aren't they, based on the last movie? So wow. <laughs> well, hold on. So you need to tell me that that's what they felt like taking out? They didn't want the censors to get a problem with them mentioning it. No, they're okay showing no, it No, but they're screen, okay showing some sort of yeah, picture. Like, <laughs> it's weird, isn't yeah, it? They can't actually say the word, yeah. It's not weird. <laughs> it's, like, it's awful. <laughs> yeah, no. But... Well, this whole movie, the way that it's written is a story in and of itself because Thunderball as a book was 
not written as a book originally. Ian Fleming had worked with uh, Kevin McClory, and I'm blanking on his other name, but um, two other people about writing a film script. And McClory had these ideas, and Fleming had these ideas, and you know they were kind of going around back and forth, whatever. The other person, I, sorry, blanking on who his name is. Um, they were trying to figure out this idea, and if you like, check out the other ideas, and you check out the other movie that came out from this. Actually, uh, some of them stick around, and some of them get changed here and there. But what happened basically was they were trying to write this movie before the movie series even happened. And it just kind of fell apart. So Fleming was like, fuck it, I'll write a book out of it, because that's what I do. And McClory, in particular, was like, that's my story, though. You can't just write a book and not give me any kind of credit for it. So this big legal battle ended up being one of the biggest things in the franchise, because he had written some of the plot elements that continued forward, like Spectre was a part of the whole thing. And um, they ended up making this settlement where they agreed to make this movie if McClory was given a producer credit. And he would also have the ability to make another version of this if he wanted to at some point down the line. And they just assumed that they were going to win any legal battle and whatever like that, which ended up biting them in the ass. Because eventually he did get a chance to make his own Bond film separate from this, which is Never Say Never Again. And it's, for, I haven't seen the full movie, but it's terrible. Absolutely okay. terrible. Is that why there's a Domino in there too? There's Domino, there's Largo, but he's changed some of the characters' names. They changed some of the characters' names in this one too, because she's not Dominique Derval in the story. And then she's, uh, Domino Patachi in the other movie and it, it's like there's never been like a full blown normal Thunderball movie because this is half Thunderball and half something else never say never again is half Thunderball and half something else and you can see where it goes like kind of haywire here and there if you look at the, the two of them and everything but that's also the reason why uh, Spectre doesn't show up in a good portion of these movies beyond a certain point because they didn't want a legal battle with Blofeld. And we're going to eventually get to a movie where Blofeld pops up, but they can't refer to him as Blofeld. So he's man in chair, <laughs> like that kind of thing. But I think they do a good enough job in this movie of masking that they're patching together a movie and a book and another thing. Uh, I do think there's there's problems here and there, but we'll get to that a little bit. Um, here's a little bit of a problem that uh, is dated uh, at the very least. We get Money Penny just for a few moments here and there, but one of them is when uh, Bond says to her, Money Penny, next time I see you, I'll put you across my knee. <laughs> and she says, I can't wait. Well, well she, and she's consenting. So. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I thought that was part of their cuteness. I, thought, I actually thought that that was a good line. <laughs> I didn't like the I'll put you across my knee type thing. <laughs> well, no, obviously, like, in certain contexts, like, that's not exactly a very good co-worker relationship, but, you know, it's, they it's, play, have... it's playful at that point in time, and they've established they've got a, a fun relationship like that. So. That's the most consensual relationship he has. Oh, well, yeah, he he asks when it comes to <laughs> Not too much else going on in there, but because we have to get into the health clinic stuff, and I don't like the health clinic stuff. Uh, he's in the same center as a Spectre agent. Uh, the stretch machine. No. Oh. <sighs> that, that is so unintentionally hilarious. It's amazing. <laughs> I don't even know where they were going with that one. Like, oh, you could have been killed. What? When, yeah, that, that, that's the thing that I don't like about it is the fact that he doesn't actually get out of it. The um, Pat. She just turns, she just, the, the nurse just turns back up and just releases him from it. Says, oh, you could have been killed from that sort of thing. And just like, and it leads to Bond then trapping um, the guy in the, in the steamer. The steam, the steam thing. It's just like, okay, that's just like, so, okay, so now we're just like prank wars, essentially. Right. Like, <laughs> I, I kind of felt it was quite good natured. I, I don't think, it's, it's obviously completely absurd, but 
the only yeah the one thing that i would have mainly changed about is like bond getting out of it some way or the woman arriving a lot sooner or something like that to like really get him out of the issue beforehand or something other than a stretch machine (laughs) because that looks ridiculous he's basically humping a table to death yeah like that's that's terrible (laughs) well is that how he strikes like thunderball (laughs) There's a moment before that where he tries to force himself on the girl. Oh, he totally forces himself on her multiple times. <laughs> and then she literally, as she's strapping him in this contraption, says, this is the safest I've felt all day. <laughs> First time I've felt safe all day. Behave yourself and all that. It's really <laughs> like, <laughs> ah. yeah, this, yeah, this is yeah, this is incredibly problematic, and again, it's one of the worst parts of the entire movie. It's the same f- issue it had with the uh, Goldfinger side of things. Mm-hmm. It's, it's almost funny in this one because they're acknowledging it, and unlike with Pussy, this one just is literally saying, "Well, I don't feel safe around you." I mean, he blackmails her later on for her <laughs> yeah, job, <laughs> right after. Well, just, just like. like I'd say I love the fact that it's, like, it's just a case that he's just been in this machine being somewhat tortured, you have to believe. And then he gets off, and then he, within like a minute, he's <laughs> he just like in the, in the steam room with her. Just like, I mean, yeah, it's, it's it's hugely problematic again. Like, if they showed some sort of playfulness, but literally she is just, get away from me, stop mm-hmm. doing this stuff with me, I'm not interested, but you know, Bond makes women interested. That's the that's the whole like line. It actually, there's a really good line later on that I'll bring up on that side of things. But but yeah, but again, this sort of thing should doesn't fly nowadays. It shouldn't have flown back then, but you know, it did. So, but it's, it it lessens my enjoyment of anything that happens with this woman. It's real bad because really yeah, they could have gotten away with it if she would have played it more of like that they've been kind of sleeping together and she's just sort of being playful like yeah, already. Like, not while I'm on duty, James, or something like that. Yeah, that sort of thing, right? yeah. Just like uh, you know, she could be like, behave yourself. Like we'll we'll get to that later, and then she'll be like, you know, oh now I feel safe, like that kind of thing. Like just that could have been instead of being like, you know, he just grabs her and starts kissing her. And she's just like, you know, like fucking knock it off. And then he's just like, well, you're going to get fired if you don't fuck me. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And you're like, wow, man, you're a... again. There's a, there's a difference between I'm a big fan of James Bond being an asshole and James Bond being like that. <laughs> that creep. Yeah. Creep. Yeah. I do like that when he, um, he's in, uh, Lippy's room, he eats a grape. <laughs> it's, yeah. Man. He eats such a, it's just one of these moments that I like a lot, and they actually reference it in uh, in Die Another Day. <laughs> but I, I just like that he's just like oh, grapes. <laughs> I was just I was bewildered because obviously the, the the story develops as you go along, which is one of my favorite things about it. But he's just like in that room, like just snooping around, going back to a bit more Detective James Bond, and then a guy with loads of bandages over his face just walks in, and I'm just yep. like yeah, okay, who's 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 this? <laughs> But then you don't figure that out until later. But when you find out, it's actually again, it's it's a bizarre approach, but it's something that only could really happen in the James Bond universe. And I kind of enjoy that side of it. And obviously face off. Yeah. Well, I've been great if Nicolas Cage was in there. Yeah. He probably could play a really good Bond villain, you know? Or really bad Bond villain in either way. Yeah. <laughs> like when we get to a view to a kill and you guys uh, are, are checking out Christopher Walken. <laughs> It's, it's very I'm much. I'm so looking forward to that. I mean, it's got Roger Moore and Christopher Walken, and Roger Moore right at the end of his run as James Bond. Like this is gonna be amazing. When he's, I think, fifty nine. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, it's it's a trip. But this guy with his bandages on his face, the plastic surgery element of this, it's uh, Spectre has hired this guy uh, to pose as. Eventually, we're gonna understand Domino's brother as he has access to a plane that is eventually going to have uh, nuclear warheads on it. We're going to get into yeah. that a little bit too. But uh, this guy's got the balls to say, I want more money. And uh, I mean, he, he's got the balls for it. He's right. He's like, you can't get anybody else to do this job. I'm the one with the plastic surgery. I'm the one that has been studying him for two years and everything. And I mean, even back in the day when I'm watching this movie as like uh, you know, more of a kid, I'm like, that fucker's dead. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, it really comes back to bite him. But but it, it made sense with this character, just the idea mm-hmm. yeah, he's the guy that looks exactly like Deval. 
So they need him to do this job. But you know, as soon as he's demanded that money and um, they've agreed to it, so Fiona's agreed to it, basically on behalf of number one, knowing full well that this guy's dead as soon as he leaves, essentially, because he demanded any more money. And also, it's bad enough because they also referenced that um, uh, the other guy. Uh, I'm trying to remember. The guy that was in the steam room. Lippy. Yeah, Lippy. Um, that he's also in trouble as well because he's the guy that vouched for him. Right. So, so, like, because he vouched for him and then he decided to basically hold them up for more money, then Lippy's probably in trouble as well after this as well. So I, I like appreciate that the balls, though. Like, he's basically saying, you know, you're putting me through a lot of shit here. I'm going to... Yeah. I deserve more. Oh, I yeah, absolutely makes that. sense. Yeah. And again, it's just cases of like villains trying to screw over other villains. Here's what doesn't make sense, though. This guy has been studying Durval for two years, and he immediately fucks up with the cap being too far back on his head and not saying ciao. <laughs> yeah, he clearly wasn't paying too much attention at that point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he doesn't really do much to make him seem like he would or would not be devour anyway because he, all he just does is get on the pl- plane he sits there in the meeting gets on the plane and then he's asked do you want to sit in the cockpit and he says yeah sure and yeah then he just goes up there and then that's so you didn't really need two years of study for that side <laughs> i uh we're gonna talk fiona um saving the discussion for later because fiona's great oh, she's um, awesome. yeah. i do like I have- the spying music at the health clinic that uh for tinker 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 kind of thing like uh uh, that they just do I, and it's one of my favorite little bits of music in the movie and i love the way that bond elbows the fire alarm <laughs> it's just it's, it's kind of like a fuck you fire alarm like that's the more dickish bond moments that i like he would have very easily just pressed it and he elbows the shit out of it which is great i thought that was the uh the doorbell <laughs> um why is a training flight armed with nuclear warheads because of the 60s <laughs> Why are you asking questions? <laughs> <laughs> because, because basically at any point in time they could have seen like the Russians going up or anything like that, and so they might have to just go into attack mode. Would be... <laughs> yeah, those damn Russians. I'm, I'm just saying, like, I could not. It's not like it's out of my realm of possibility thinking that a training ship would have atomic weapons on it. It's not the biggest leap, but at the same time, I, that's something I didn't think about until this time watching it around. I'm like, you know, they do say it's a training thing and i wouldn't think you'd give them actual nuclear warheads but then again maybe it's just like that's ah, the last step of training where you actually have live yeah. rounds kind of thing yeah maybe it's also just training to see whether and again this sounds like awful so the bombs can stay up there in flight and stuff like that without malfunctioning or anything like that but it's a dangerous world in the 1960s yeah i mean everyone's uh, carrying everyone seems to be carrying around some sort of nuclear weapon and we've established in previous movies, your car can go slightly off the road and immediately explode. So, Oh, no, I Wait. want to talk about this as well, because this is the thing that leads into it, because he obviously he basically kills every other crew member by flying around with some sort of uh, toxic gas. And then he goes into the water, plane hits the water, doesn't burst into flames. That's another note that I have. <laughs> it actually doesn't explode on impact like other vehicles. Yeah. I, but again... This movie does stretch absurdity probably more than any movie beforehand, but I kind of admire the balls of it for doing that with the underwater landing lights. <laughs> just, like, just leading the guy down the, the stretch to make sure he can land the plane in the water before going like further down. And you see the obviously toy model plane go about <laughs> go about two feet underwater and it's hit the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> again, it's a, again, I just watched that and just, I'm bursting out laughing because get it it's absurd it's like it's amateur hour at the absolute best but it's like it's a 60s bomb movie i can kind of allow it a little bit of leeway if it makes me laugh and it doesn't make me just like roll my eyes then i'm kind of gonna go, go along with it it does make you wonder how low the bar was when it's like this is one of the biggest franchises ever and this is what was captivating people yeah it's it's just funny uh so Angelo's dead too. Serves you right. You know your purpose is over, fucko. And uh, Lippy goes after Bond. Fiona kills Lippy with a rocket from a motorcycle, no less. <laughs> Badass bitch. Love awesome. love Fiona. Again, where I'm going to hold off on discussion on Fiona. Um, we get a little bit more of the uh, conference type stuff. Bond almost throws his hat, but the rocket's a little bit closer, so he just places it, and he's disappointed. I like that little moment. <laughs> It's just sort of, I'm going to throw my hat at it. Oh, it's right here. All right. Mm. <laughs> yeah. 
But we get this really cool thing where it's a conference of double O's and he's late and Emma's pissed, you know, because you got to have that little contemptuous kind of vibe. We see a bunch of agents and it's not brought attention to whatsoever, but one of them is a woman. So everybody who's flipping out about Nomi in the next film, it's established here. Women can be double O's. Relax. Even back in the 60s, they were okay with the idea. But they talk about how, uh, you know, uh, Blofeld's like, you know, you will place this money with, uh, you know, then this part and have ben, Big Ben strike an extra time and all this other kind of stuff. And they're like, oh, I guess we're going to make the payment. This guy's got our uh, Thunderballs in a grip. So uh, we're just going to do that. And uh, I like that uh, the folders are abbreviated OHMSS, which, again, we'll get into with Honor Majesty Secret Service. Uh, they codename it Thunderball. I don't know why. Again, they, they just gave they just gave weird code names. It doesn't not every single, not every single like yeah secret mission that they've ever gone on stuff like that needs to be directly referencing something in the in the code name. Otherwise, it'd be kind of easy to decipher what the code name was supposed to be about. And at least that's got some precedent too. I mean, we got Operation Paperclip and different things, so mm. it's not like it's you know they they have to go. Oh, it's Operation uh, Get Blofeld. Or something. <laughs> do, you, do you know what Thunderball is usually referred to in the UK? Nope. So we have a national lottery, as obviously a lot of countries do. Um, and the Thunderball is something at the end of the, like, where you get like seven numbers in a row. And then there's the Thunderball, which gives you like the, ex- like, if you get all the seven numbers and then the Thunderball, it gives you access to like the mega, mega j- jackpot. Uh, we call that a Powerball in America. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's what. That's the only thing that I ref, that I have as a frame of reference to what's something's called a Thunderball before. I hope that when they're doing the lottery and they announce that they do the little ba da 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 before they do it. Like uh, no, no, they actually like go by the name and just do a crack of thunder before it's released and stuff like that. <laughs> like if they're like, all right, your numbers for today are 32, 16, 8, and your Thunderball is da 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 four. Like you know, that'd be great if that was the case. <laughs> Even better if it was Blofeld doing it because he's got that great voice. <laughs> Number four. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like that M trusts Bond's hunch on uh, Domino. Yeah, and you know, uh, they do the obvious trope of Bond sees a picture with a woman in a bikini on it, and yeah. so that's kind of <laughs> he's just like, "I want to check and this out." He calls him out, and it's straight away. And that I love the thought. Of that. It's a great little moment where she says, "You may be able to con the old man, but I know better," and he overhears her. Mm-hmm. He's just like, uh, no, he didn't get me either. And, yeah. and thank you not to call me the old man. There's a, a good little moment, too, where she gives him the photograph, and she's like, well, how else could you recognize her? And he goes, how, how can I miss? She's got two moles on her left thigh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So they they cut out the idea of, like, he has to try to find her. We just kind of skip to the point where it's like, all right, let's just go to Domino. Domino's trapped underwater. Bond saves her. It's a little meet cute type thing. Uh, she's played by Claudine Arger, who is gorgeous. Yeah. She's been the be- best looking Bond girl so far. My 100%. God. She, uh, like, when I originally a- watched these films as a kid, I did not have an appreciation for how beautiful she is. Uh, she was a former uh, Miss World winner, I believe. Yeah, something along those lines. Miss France or something. I she forget. It was like a Miss France side of things. Yeah, so she um, oh, she was the first runner-up in the 1958 Miss World contest. Yeah, it's. I mean, she is just stunning. Stunning, and, yeah. Uh, originally, the character wasn't written as French, and they went with her, and that's one of the reasons why she's Dominique Durval instead of uh, Domino Patachi and whatever. Um, they were just like, fuck it. She's just so good looking. Of course, they dub her like practically everybody else. I mean, uh, Largo is dubbed in this movie and, uh, you know, other people too. And you guessed it. You know, it's uh, Nikki Commander still. So, <laughs> so, um, I, well, I guess we'll hold off a little bit on Domino uh, too. We also get introduced to another one of the Bond girls in this, Paula, who is played by Martine Beswick from, from Russia with Love, one of the gypsy fighters. Oh, that's cool. I didn't uh, actually um, clock that side of it, but yeah, she, uh, I, well, she was the one that looked like her. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, they liked her enough originally around where I think she had um, a- actually 
it might have been. I, I don't know for hundred percent for sure if I'm right on this, but like she had uh, auditioned for Doctor No, and they were like, "Well, you know, get like some experience, and we'll bring you back." And then they brought her back for for Much with Love, and they liked her so much that they were like, "You know, what? let's give her like an actual part." And I like Paula a lot. I love how she plays so obviously dumb with the boat not starting, just like, well, I don't know. I can't get it started. I guess James is going to have to go on your boat, like that kind of thing. I like her. I think she gets a little bit of a raw deal in this film. Yeah. I, I think that, so she he refers to her as like his assistant on this trip. Um, as far as I saw with Mike doing some just like extra research, she is actually supposed to be a CIA agent. Yeah, we uh, we get her, we get Pinder, and we get Felix. We'll talk about them, but yeah, but they don't really do too much on the lines of. I think that her character doesn't get enough time on this one, or doesn't get to show enough initiative, which is mm-hmm. one of the detriments in the movie for me. Agreed. I would, in retrospect, if you could, you know, tweak elements of this movie, I would merge her and Pinder, and just have her and Felix. I like the idea of having a sacrificial lamb in some fashion. I mean, it could have been Pinder, you know, but like, I think if you give Paula what Pinder does and you eventually kill her off in a different fashion or something, I think that that works better. I think you could have said it was obviously the point where we talk about later when she gets kidnapped. I think the point of if she could have just fallen off the guys and then Fiona's the one that takes her down. Yeah. I think you save her then a little bit more. I think it was just too easy to get her trapped. So. I like her though. She is one of those characters that I I tend not to remember a lot when thinking about the Bond girls, but I, I thumbs up on Paula. Yeah. Of course, you know, a great looking girl on top of that too. Um here's something I didn't really realize until it was pointed out to me. Domino was always wearing black and white. I don't know why I didn't realize that. It's good attention to detail. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh <laughs> have you guys ever had conch chowder? I have not. How did how does he keep pronouncing this? Conch chowder, I think. Yeah, it's 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 because his accent, obviously, like this this heavy Scottish brogue. But it's just he it doesn't sound like he's saying conch chowder. Just a like, conch chowder like that. <laughs> sort of, just like so weird. Have you ever had it? No, I've not had it. No, I, I eat seafood. So. I want to try it at some point just to see what it's like. But I I, I don't know. It might be great. It might be bad. I obviously can't speak to it being an aphrodisiac or being tasty at all, but they make it a big point. <laughs> it's like a back and forth discussion on two different scenes about this chowder. So I'm just like, yeah, eh, kind of curious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> chowder, I'll, I'll kill you. Reference, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a little back and forth. How do you know uh, my friends call me Domino? Oh, it's on your bla- uh, bracelet. I'm a sharp little eyes you've got. I'll wait till you get to my teeth. <laughs> 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 All right. I mean, you know what he's like, but at least that's playful. At least he's not leaving. Yeah. Into whatever. It's a lot better than Patricia Fearing uh, played out with the, uh, uh, oh, you yeah. know. I, I don't mind Bond being flirtatious. Just, you know, you don't have to actually immediately be sticking your dick inside someone as soon as you meet them. That's all. That's, yeah. kind of the, that's kind of the difference here. Is that not how you get to meet people? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you got a checklist. It's like uh, threaten them with their job, use a mink glove. (laughs) God, it's awful. (laughs) Um, I really like the card game. Uh, Again, it's uh, Shaman Defer or something, I think is like the variation of uh, Baccarat. I I have no idea how it fucking works. So again, I immediately, again, because I've watched all the Austin Powers movies, so I can see the reference to that. So this is exactly like him meeting number two mm-hmm. in the in the first movie. And so it's obvious where the reference is from that one, because he's wearing the eye patch. I mean, he looks like a Bond villain. He just looks like a Bond villain. The eye patch, the tuxedo, the grey hair. Just, yeah, he is like an archetype of what a Bond villain should look like. Yes. He, um is like we established in Dr. No, he's got the messed up hands. And for much with love, nobody has anything weird going on. In Goldfinger, well, you don't really have too much weird for Goldfinger, but our job is mute. And in this one, Largo's got an eye patch. So it's like most Bond villains have something with their face in particular. Uh, 
he is an Italian actor. He was very much like, I don't really want to play stereotypical Italian mobsters, but I'll play this part kind of a thing. He gets dubbed. I don't really know why. It, it seems like his voice was fine enough. What I don't like about the scene, though, is, uh, I mean, I like it, but I don't like it. I think it could have been done a little bit better is what I should probably say instead is just how over the top Bond is as far as like, hey, you're from Spectre, huh? Because he's just like, I thought I saw a Spectre of Defeat. You know, Spectre is over your thing because you're a Spectre, right? Spectre, Spectre, Spectre. <laughs> I, I get the impression while well, just listed that Bond doesn't care that he knows that he's part of Spectre. Yeah, it's just, just toying with it's just toying with him with that information. It's interesting because that happens, and then he's like, "Hey, can I get your girl a drink?" <laughs> he doesn't try to hide at all. Well, that's very Bond. So. Yeah, I like it. Uh, how, uh, how brash he is, and um, it's kind of weird that when Domino's talking to him, she's like, "You know, well, I'm a kept woman or a mit- mistress or whatever," and he's like, uh. They, they kind of have a little bit of a cover of her being Largo's niece. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of like. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't get that either. But I guess as she said, it is better than just saying, oh, no, I'm his mistress. Yeah. And she's like, you know, my brother is so great, blah, blah, blah. We'll get back to the brother later on. But... Were you about to say? No, but uh, just niece. It's a very weird. It's a weird cover. I do enjoy the fact that we're actually getting to know this woman. Yeah. that That's just one huge, massive plus point in this movie. Um, several times throughout this movie, we see Felix in the background watching over Bond when he's talking to, to Domino and so on and so forth. And he looks a lot more like his Dr. No version. It's not Jack Lord, though. It's uh, Rick Van Neuter. And <laughs> I'm like, why don't you just introduce yourself to your buddy? You've gone through a couple of things already at this point. Just go like, hey, James, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, they do this whole thing where it's like, you know, let's send back the guy who's going after him. He's a small fish. We're going to send him back to Largo. And Oh, I just, that, I've just got on the reference with that now. About what, the small like, fish? Yeah, the fact that he's a small fish and they feed into the sharks. Yeah. <laughs> that's, such, yeah. that's so good. I, that's... Like, now I'm just clock that it's even better that's a good little moment and that's not the last that we'll see sharks in this movie or in the series and uh sharks are great yeah yeah it's the perfect like this guy has a pool full of sharks he's the greatest bomb villain like (laughs) they need laser beams on their head so the scenes that they film with the pool and all that that's at this one dude's uh random like house they just like location scouting and they found this house and they were like, yeah, can we film there? That guy <laughs> kept inviting people over to watch the uh, production crew as just like entertainment of like, Hey, just like sit back and watch them film this movie at my place. And it got to a point where they kept having parties and people would get totally drunk and just be a pain in the ass for the people filming the movie, which I can't even imagine how, Stressful that would have been on the days where they had sharks there. <laughs> but that was a big selling point was he had like a salt water tank and all this other kind of shit. So um, the sharks get their moment in the sun, so to speak. Uh, Q does as well. We had our Q scene. He's in tropical tire. You know, he's uh, having more fun. They go through a laundry list of gadgets in this one. He's got a Geiger counter watch. Not his best watch, but, you know, serves its purpose. You're very useful. Bond acts like a fucking schoolboy in this. <laughs> Q even says, treat it with equal contempt. <laughs> yeah, that's the best That's the best part of it. Is like, yes, like, like, yeah, I know how you treat every single gadget with equal contempt when he's trying to say, oh, he treats them with all just equal care and stuff like that. It's just, yeah. The way he says contempt is just so good. And like Bond, that remark. And Bond always questions the validity and cleverness of Q's gadgets, and Q's always having to be on the defensive about them. So no, these are really clever. These are really good. Uh, there's uh there's a flare, there's an underwater camera. Imagine that. You can take pictures. Underwater. <laughs> that would never happen. <laughs> Dates itself, you know. There's a quote unquote harmless radioactive device that he could swallow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even if it is harmful you know just wash it off yeah 
<laughs> He's been through enough radio, uh, radioactive material at this point. <laughs> he was next to a bomb and Goldfinger. He's, you know. Uh, and there's the uh, the short term breathing apparatus as well. The rebreather is the best one, I yeah. think. I'm pushed about the um, the homing device inside the pill. So how long did Bond have to kind of stay constipated for across this journey to make sure they didn't just pass through his sister? Well, no, he takes it later on in the movie. I, I thought, because like, when they um, kind of show it in the thing, he's just, like, he now. Q and says, like, now? It's like, so I assumed that he'd taken it then. Now, later on, uh, towards, I think it's like the, maybe actually it's like the tail end. It's um, when he is putting on the scuba gear, he pops it in his mouth. All right. So, yeah, he didn't just uh, make sure he didn't take a shit at any point in the movie. <laughs> I love the rebreather. The rebreather pops up. It's one of the few Bond gadgets that's used more than once. And it's actually one of my favorite parts of uh, Dino of the Day, where it's like, hey, look, the thing that works. Let's keep doing that. You know? It's like, heavily, use- he- he- heavily useful. Yeah, it's a four minute rebreather, and Bond uses it more than once in this movie, too. Why not? A lot longer than four minutes. Yeah, way more. <laughs> this isn't quite a gadget, but it's worth talking about. Uh, Fiona wears a, a ring. <laughs> it's the Spectre logo. <laughs> oh, she's proud and, of it. And it's like, oh, you noticed that. Let me just, you know, turn the ring around kind of a thing. Uh, I don't I don't like the, the ring. And the ring pops up in another movie, too. <laughs> it's a different story. Uh, we get back and forth with Largo and Bond. There's a, a fun little uh, sequence where he's basically showing him around his place and just like, yeah, look at this. I got sharks. I got a, uh, I got this gun. What do you think about this? And Bond's like, this gun's more fitting for a woman. And he says, well, you know a lot about guns. And he goes, no, I know a bit about women. <laughs> 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 and I love with the clay pigeons <laughs> that he's like, Oh, that seems terribly difficult. Barely turns around, shoots it. Oh, it isn't. <laughs> it's just a just a big show off. He's just everything that he tries to do um, around Largo is to try and intimidate him. It's he's, a dick measuring contest for sure. Yeah. Quite frankly, he's a piece of shit. He's our <laughs> piece of shit. Okay. Uh, let's talk about this guy, Mister Vargas. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't make love. He doesn't really do much of anything because he's one of the weakest henchmen that's out there. Yeah, I, I don't know why they decided to give him any sort of real characteristics. I'm fine with them just having like nameless henchmen that try and do some work for him, but why they had to actually try and build some sort of narrative for this guy and then not follow through on it? Uh, I, I don't like Vargas. He, he yeah. looks like a creepy guy. He seems like the sort of guy that would be a villain, but not a very major one. Well, if you think about it, he doesn't do all these things. And you think he's weak, but he's probably one of those guys that just keeps, you know, limbs in a <laughs> freezer somewhere. It was, it was, it, that Largo moves on, and it's like, um, oh, every man has his passion. What's your passion? He says his passion is fish, because he's got the sharks in the tank. And then he asked Bomber who, what his passion is, and he says that he's not a very passionate man. And then he just stares at Domino in a bikini for about, like, five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this... um. At this point in the movie, you've pretty much met all of the characters. Uh, they, yeah, you know, everybody else at this point is just sort of like hey, the guy who works with the the bombs and, and that kind of thing. So it's mm. we're we're firmly on this journey of Paula, Pinder, Felix, and Bond on the good side of things. Domino stuck in the middle where she she is good. We're not getting any kind of like, well, maybe she might not be good or whatever. We know that she's good. And um, she's on the villainous side of things, just, you know, uh, as a kept woman. And we got Vargas, who sucks. And you've got Largo, who is the, you know, puppeteer, the whole thing, whatever. And we've been introduced, of course, at this point, well, you know, before this point, to Fiona. Fiona Volpe is easily one of my favorite characters in this franchise. She is not only sexy as hell but she is so fucking good as far as like she has agency she calls bond out on his bullshit like uh I, there's oh let's yeah, put it this I, way I, let's no, I took that. we we don't get 
reintroduced to her, but we kind of get reintroduced to her in the bathtub. So first off, it's like a beautiful woman in a bathtub, naked, great kind of a thing. And I love that she asks Bond for something to for her to put on, and he hands her slippers. <laughs> and she just rolls her eyes like, you dick, <laughs> you know? That's a great moment, though. That's a very Bond. It's very... Uh, it's just it hits all the marks. That's one of my favorite things. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I was gonna say, like once they've actually just made love, and she shows to be a bit like aggressive in the bedroom and stuff like that, just a few like bites and stuff like that. But then my favorite part of the whole Fiona thing is when Bond is now captured afterwards, like surrounded by henchmen. Um, she, like you said, she calls him out on his bullshit by basically saying like, "Oh, but how Bond, like James Bond, the guy that can make love as soon as he makes love to a woman, mm-hmm. turns her to the side of good." Yeah. And she says, "Yeah, that's not going to happen with me." Just like, "Yes, and this is my favorite femme fatale." <laughs> yeah, right. she she's you know, oh, uh, Mister Mister Bond, James Bond, and all this, and uh, you know, his reputation is you fuck someone and told her on the side of right and virtue, but not her, and she that's sticks true. to it. Like she does not waver on that. Yeah, I watching this, I'm like, oh, this is Callum will enjoy this. You just get that feeling because, as we've talked about, you know, this. Oh well, my magical penis can solve all your problems. <laughs> no. So this makes up to a certain extent for the way that Pussy Glory is like. I'm immune to your charms. Oh, you kissed me. Never mind. I'm going to go against the villain that I've been plotting with this whole thing for years. Fiona, uh, <laughs> she has a great line too that I completely had forgotten about until this time I rewatched it, where she says, "You made a shocking mess of my hair, you sadistic brute." <laughs> it's just like, God, you fucked up my hair when we were having sex like this. And I love that Bond says, uh, um, "What I did this evening was for Queen and Country. You don't think you gave me any pleasure, do you?" <laughs> yeah, and she, she just talks about how like she's hurt his ego and how. Like I always said, like the magical James Bond hasn't changed his side of things, and he basically just go, "We well, can't win them all." Yeah. <laughs> like even under this sort of pressure, he's like, "Okay, I'll just make a bit of a joke about it," because that's his defense mechanism. There's another good little part here that gets swept under the rug, where she says uh, he gets dressed fast, and she didn't even notice the gun, and he says, "Well, not that it matters, but that gun was under the pillow the whole time." This is called back more than once, and it's one of my favorite things about the series. They reference it directly in Tomorrow Never Dies. They show it elsewhere in, like, Die Another Day. Die Another Day is one of the only things that's good about Die Another Day is its references to other movies. But I love the idea that Bond puts his gun under his pillow. And he just has it ready to go. You know, you never know what you're going to need. You figure Miss Taro uh, was somebody who's a femme fatale. And he never knew really what was going on with Tatiana. Uh, so he couldn't really fully trust her. Uh, Domino um, isn't in the same kind of regard, but you know, Pussy Galore was a villain, and uh, Tilly Masterson was not a villain, but she was like she almost killed him and whatever. So it's like, yeah, he is always going to have his gun ready, which uh, it, I love the gun under the pillow thing. We'll get back to that two, three something more times. Doesn't. Um, doesn't- Stop him enough to make him not actually want to sleep with these women and put himself in a vulnerable situation. It's just, okay, yeah. as long as I have the gun under the pillow, I'm fine. I mean, look at Fiona, though. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't blame <laughs> They dance at the Kiss Kiss, uh, Kiss, Kiss Club, and uh, he notices that there's a gun uh, trained towards him, and he just spins her around just in time enough for her to get shot instead. And one of my favorite lines in the franchise would you mind if my friend sits this one out? She's just dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a couple of things about this. First of all, they go through this big chase through the, um, it, it's, it's like a Mardi Gras parade. I think they call it something else afterwards. Um, yeah, but, uh, I forget the name, through, but they're Mardi, Mardi Gras in that area. Yeah, so they're going through it. Um, uh, Varga shoots at Bond's ankle, so he starts bleeding. So that's how they keep tracking him through the parade, is the fact that he's bleeding from the ankle. And so he eventually gets to the Kiss Kiss Club after avoiding detection for a while. But um, Fiona's there to meet him and you just feel like, oh, he can't escape. And he's just toying around with her and she's toying around with him because she thinks that she's got the upper hand in the situation. But then he 
turns her back to it. And that's and that is one of my favorite scenes in the entire Austin Powers franchise. Yep. Is is mocked off of this with the um um I'll can't remember what the um the character it's Powers Shag, name is. Uh... Yeah. But um uh, Robin Swallows, yeah, that's it. I don't know. <laughs> and it's just the yeah, it's just the idea that's like where she just gets shot repeatedly in the chest. <laughs> yeah. the, that that is one of the greatest scenes in the entire Austin Powers franchise, and it's born off of this really good moment. So so yeah, everything that Fiona did. Again, the death's a little bit muted, but I guess you kind of have to just kill her off before you go into the main like action sequence towards the end of it. So I'm not too too against it. And she did show a lot of initiative in her sections of the movie. So any other thoughts about this whole sequence, uh, Rob? No, no, Callum pretty much covered it. I was going to bring up the Austin Powers stuff because at this point, it I really just want to watch all of those movies back now because I get it better because I actually know the scenes that they're mocking. But yeah. It is kind of crazy when you watch those kind of movies because like I had seen the Bond films before I had seen Austin Powers. So I I got the reference this year and there, but I didn't when it came to Robin Hood Men in Tights, which is my favorite comedy of all time. And I didn't watch Robin Hood Prince of Thieves until I don't know if, a dozen years or something way more after that point. And then I'm like, Oh my God, this is actually a reference to this and that and that and that instead of just a funny moment here and there. And probably Thunderball more than any is the one that Austin Powers is parodying. So it kind of makes you think that this is probably one of their favorite movies. Um, Bond and Domino have sex underwater. (laughs) Hell yeah. Yeah. Uh, he sucks out the sea urchin spine or whatever she stepped on, and yeah, that's one for the foot fetishes out there. Yeah, <laughs> it leads to some one of my least favorite parts of this movie, which is Vargas is behind you, and then he just turns around and kills him. Oh, now he does that. have a good little line of I think he got the point, but I don't know. It's just that's such a weak way to kill off this character. It's just oh, uh, there's Vargas. Oh, okay, all right, I killed him. Vargas sucks. <laughs> I, I, I'm fine with like them, some, them, them being some quite incompetent and impotent henchmen every now and again. I think that's there's some people that Bond should just kill. I'm totally fine. With it. He's he a did, main he, henchman he, though, he, other than Fiona. We just, he's just because he's a main henchman. He just he's he's a named henchman. I mean, he's a competent one. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean that he's any good at what he does. Just because he's a named henchman doesn't mean that. I mean, they 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 already like they were the ones that uh, kidnapped. Paula and so had her tortured and so she, that's why she committed suicide and so they have done something of no it's obviously nothing that's hurt Bond in any way but they have gotten rid of one of the agents by their actions so kind of like skipped over all the entire thing like him just scoping out the entire and obviously no no we're not we're not to cover the whole movie but one of the um the more where the sharks show a bit of like non-initiative as it were because he uh Largo traps him under a pool with a the with a henchman, so he's obviously showing another henchman that's completely expendable. Bond stabs him, so he starts bleeding. So the sharks that are led into the pool go after the guy that's bleeding, so Bond can escape where they came from, essentially. So, but but yeah, I, I don't mind there being just people there that are just there to die. Well, I think this movie once you kill off Fiona, it goes massively downhill like uh yeah domino and bond are talking and she's like oh this might not be important but here's like all the information that you'll need for the whole rest of the movie (laughs) and the underwater stuff to me snoozeville none of it's filmed in an exciting way it's a lot of the same types of shots it's just black scuba suits and blue water going slowly and it goes on forever it seems like the whole back end of this film is underwater yeah, I think the, that's um, part of the problem with these films being so long is a lot of the times, you know, by the end of the movie, that scene with the the stretch, the little torture thing that he was humping to death <laughs> felt like so long ago, you know. Uh, but again, I think that's just because these films are a little too long for my taste. I d- didn't mind the underwater stuff as much. In fact, I think you're a little too harsh on this movie i actually think it's 
pretty decent. I went into this because of what you said, thinking it wouldn't be as good. Yeah, so the underwater stuff does go on way too long. And again, that's a bit of an issue with it because you could use certain that time like to build up other characters, maybe do a few more moments with them. But, and I'm trying to do this thing where you guys mentioned it beforehand, I'm trying to actually do it where I'm placing my mind in 1965. Mm-hmm. And in 1965, this would have been fucking awesome. This, 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 yeah. elect, like this jet ski, jet powered like device they've got that they're, they're carrying the uh atomic bombs around and bond replaces one of the henchmen so he's working undercover there's this hidden rock which actually has some sort of like is like some storage facility where they've got the bombs kept and that's where they figure out the bond is with them and so he has to fly out he has to use the homing beacon to get the guy to find him with the um helicopter so they can pick him up and then there's again, it's not the best shot thing in the world, but the giant like scuba versus like the the good guy scubas against the bad guy <laughs> scubas, all the harpoons flying around and everything like that. There's some really good action stuff with Bond when he gets down in there because like the him taking off the like he has this jet powered thing on his back, so it's basically a jet ski for the water, or well, not a jet ski, a jet pack for the water, should I say? Where he's just flying around all over the place, and then he uses that to distract them, and then throws a bomb in and kills a few of the henchmen like that. He's pulling masks off all over the place and he's cutting them uh, their oxygen supply so he's drowning as many of them as he possibly can underwater yeah i think that even though it isn't shot the best in in the world it is like more action-packed than a lot of stuff we've seen in the bond movie so far as far as uh being shot terribly it's nowhere near as bad as the boat with that rear no. projection <laughs> oh that that stuff with just like them just moving the uh, moving the steering wheel around, just flying about all over the place. It's just, but again, it's as long as it, I know it's bad, but it's hilarious. So I can kind of just like let it slide a little bit as long as it's making me have fun while I'm watching it. And Largo is do doing these punches that are ridiculous. <laughs> it's like mm. uh, he, when he gets killed, he gets killed by Domino, which is good. I like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. But he falls on top of the steering wheel and they're like, well, I mean, we can't just like throw him off of it. He's yeah, locked he's it. Like, Let's get out of there. Like, you know. Yeah. But yeah, that that's that, that was going way too fast for any of the situations. They, I love the part where the boat splits in half. <laughs> and so they feel like they've made an extra escape because they've they've just left some people on board the the outer shell of the boat to basically fight off the Americans and die because they've gone to Miami at this point. But they keep driving away and yeah, it's way, way, way too fast, and they make it look try and make it look so dramatic, and it just looks shit in modern life. But, but, but yeah, I like the fact Domino kills him. Yeah, I, th- I think that the whole closing sequence is just again, it's too long, but I think what they achieved in that was really good. I do like that Domino killed them. Uh, I want to go back to what Carol said about putting yourself in that mindset of it's 1965 because I just. I can't imagine somebody looking at that and just going, well, this is just the most amazing technological advance that I've ever seen. This is what life is. This is the future. Just because of where we are now in life. But I'm sure there had to be many who were just like, yeah, this is the peak of cinema right here. <laughs> look, you can't get any better than this. Look at look at those punches. Look at all that, that underwater no action. This is, this is what movies were made to be back when they were, came out with silent films they were thinking of this this is it the peak it kind of looks like the silent film if you think about it yeah in certain aspects of it i mean again the, the punching and fighting isn't the greatest in certain aspects of it again it's there's a lot of camera cuts and stuff like that to try and disguise when stuntmen are used and stuff like that but i think overall it just tells a, a, a real struggle for bond to get there because the final like half an hour or so of the movie is bond going after this guy and like putting the final grand pieces together and just chasing after them there's a lot of action there's a lot of moments where you think the bad guys might escape and yeah but i think that i think that it's climb it's climactic it's not it's not like it doesn't end in some sort of damn squib for me the ending of the movie is one of my least favorites it's uh they get this um like life raft and they hook up a like a tow cable and it f- sends them flying through the air 
seems terribly dangerous compared to floating back to, you know, just the shore. And it's just an abrupt ending. There's no dialogue, no quip, nothing. You don't even see that guy that's just like, hey, by the way, I'm I'm a good guy now. I, I disarmed the advice uh the device and threw that in the ocean, whatever. I'm saving Domino from being tortured. And like it's just sort of like, all right, here's your life raft. Fuck off. We're gonna go into this other thing. And then we're going to fly into the air like that. And it's ba da 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 I'm like, whoa, what? Are you already at the end? End credits, the end. I don't like how they did that. It is a bit abrupt. But maybe this is one of those things where they felt like them flying through the air would be action-packed and exciting. And eh, you've gotten quips and stuff like that in the other films. Let's give you something shorter here. Oh, they definitely had to think. If you go back to the '60s, they're probably like, "Oh my god, this is amazing! <laughs> he's just gonna, yeah, he's, he's flying, flying the air on the back of a jet, the back of a jet. <laughs> like he's the peak of manhood." <laughs> they're like the people are like fainting in the theater, with like fanning themselves after all this action with the boat, and then it happens, and then they just completely pass out. <laughs> well, I can only imagine that was the case. <laughs> like, like, that's like. You go back in time now and you watch like Star Wars movies or stuff like that, you none know, of the special effects on nowhere near as good as they could do nowadays. But at the time they were just yeah, they this is the most iconic thing we've ever seen. <laughs> it's like game changing stuff and this movie feels like it's game changing. I wish I could think of a really good quip that would happen with Domino, like some kind of playoff for her name. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I think it would have been better. Like, I don't like when the movies end like that. That's going to be a thing going forward for me, just like in the other ones. I like when they I at least have like a moment that it ends on instead of just being like the thing exploded. Bond goes, oh, yeah, that, that exploded. Um, so like I, 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 every movie, not even just the Bond movies. Any movie that ends like that, it's jarring and I don't like it. I, I like it more when we get to something like The Raw Sign Enough, which, you know, uh, obviously we'll get to in like multiple movies. But um, that's sort of the, it's like, there you go. That's uh, that's Thunderball. And to me, this ranks above Dr. No, but it ranks below Goldfinger and uh, From Rush With Love. I think it's. It's under Goldfinger, but it's above the other two for me. I've, I've let no secret. This is above all three of them for me. This is the best one so far. So how would you guys rank? What was your ranking so far? It's uh, Rob would be Goldfinger, then Thunderball. Then uh, From Russia With Love. Then, then Doctor Now. Yeah, Calumir, got... Thunderball, then... Thunderball, Goldfinger, Doctor Now, and then Russia With Love. And for anybody that's keeping track of mine, uh... Actually, I don't know. Rush with Love, Goldfinger. I don't know. One of those two, and then Thunderball, and then the Doctor Now. <laughs> um, no, I'll I'll play a cop out when it comes to that. Um, probably put Thunderball above From Rush with Love. I don't know. I mean, uh, Goldfinger above From Rush with Love. But going back to some of the other things we talked about, uh, the music. Uh, we mostly already talked about it. Um, thumbs up for me. Yeah, thumbs up. Yeah, it's a bit middle of the road for me. The action thumbs down for me as far as the way that they filmed it, every part of it with the sped up footage. And I don't like the uh, let's have him fight somebody in drag. And I, I don't dig the underwater stuff as much. I wish that Largo was a little bit more of a of a threat. Like maybe I don't know, maybe merge Largo and Vargas together in some fashion. But We'll get to him with the villains and stuff. Uh, the actions. Jesus, if you were a Bond villain, your entire life would be built on just merging things for your benefit. It might be. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have an eye patch though. Um, Action-wise, thumbs up or thumbs down for you guys? Um, could be could, could be improved upon, but I think overall thumbs up for me. I'm gonna say overall thumbs up, and that there was. A considerable amount of it, but thumbs down in how it was shot. And yeah, I didn't like all that sped up stuff. The humor, thumbs up for me. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. I mean, some of the Pretty humor good, doesn't good. land quite as well <laughs> these no, days, I... but most of it is great. In particular, the, you know, uh, 
she's just dead. And uh, <laughs> those kind of elements are, I just, I absolutely love that. There was one that I referenced in the very beginning where uh, after he gets out of the steam room, he's just like, see you later, close the door, alligator. Like he had to finish the line. Like when we're doing a podcast with Tony and he has to get his shit in with these quips. <laughs> and that just stuck with me. Like, Jesus, Bond, you really needed to say alligator? Well, well it wasn't alligator, he said. He said irrigator. Because he got out of the irrigation room. That's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why he does it because he's got to do, you know, a twist on the on the phrase, and you can't. As somebody who appreciates his puns and stuff, when you get a situation like that, you got to take advantage of it. Mm, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. If you say, you know, somebody's got the total package and I can't get out Lex Luger, and then I feel like ah. I, Shit, I didn't get it. <laughs> you know, like that kind of to thing. the point where you mentally screw with me, and when I'm doing a podcast with others and say total package, I go not Lex Luger. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the allies in this um, Pinder Pinder's Pinder. Uh, he's he's not really you know <laughs> not that much you can say there. He's he's no quarrel. I'll say that. No. I I like Paula a lot. Paul is good. Uh, Felix is much better than he is in Goldfinger. Yeah. Less goofy. <laughs> and I guess that's it. Q and M and, uh, Q&M and all that. Q Q is fantastic. Q is always there. If there's one thing that's always a win, it's Q. Q is Q. perpetually good. Money Penny and James have the best relationship, and yeah. M is always fun. Yeah, Bernard Lee is my second favorite M. You give uh, Bond plus any of those three at the office, it's good. Even the worst uh, scenarios, it's good. Uh, what else we didn't go? Uh, the gadgets. Um, big fan of all of them, for the most part. I mean, obviously some of them are dated, like the underwater camera and whatever. But at the time, they were groundbreaking and impressive. And the rebreather is great. Uh, having a Geiger counter and a watch it is interesting and uh, you know you've got the um the motorcycle that Fiona's got you got the uh, underwater vehicle type stuff thumbs up all around on the on the gadget side of things for thunderball yeah agreed i unlike tony enjoyed the jetpack from the very beginning um the car shooting basically having a hose attached was fun and Everything Q introduced was top notch. Yeah, everything that Q introduced had a purpose. It was all used throughout the movie in certain, in some fashion or another. Yeah, the jetpack, the jet powered thruster underwater and stuff like that. It's all yeah, it's it was I think it was all very futuristic. It made it seem like Bond has access to stuff that us mere mortals can't possibly atta- atta- uh, attain to. And the girls and the villains, because one of them's kind of both. Um Thumbs down on Vargas for me. Uh, indifferent. Yeah, I'm indifferent. Thumbs in the middle, if not up, for Largo to me. I mean, he's not the most intimidating. He's not the most memorable, but he serves his purpose. So I like him overall. I think he's a huge thumbs up. I think he's been the best villain so far in terms of major, like the main antagonist. Major thumbs up. He is number two. I still yeah. like Goldfinger better. And actually, I, I like think, uh, I Rosa Goldfinger Club better. Goldfinger doesn't have any... Goldfinger can't do anything, really. He's just... He's he's just a big businessman, and Bond has him neutered at every single turn. I know Bond plays around with it, but at least, like, um, Largo is involved in the scuba diving side of things. He does kill um, Angelo as well. He has the shark pit. I think he's just a more over, overall just more convincing villain than, than Goldfinger is. Goldfinger could fly. <laughs> no, he could have announced the problem. <laughs> he could float. From the uh, fair. But the best villain is Fiona to me. Fiona's great. Yeah, awesome. Best yeah. femme fatale. She is the best femme fatale in the entire franchise in my mind. And the only the only one that gives her a run for her money, if not potentially surpasses her, it's gonna take a while before we get to her, which is Xenia. But yeah. 
uh, Fiona is not only one of the best characters as far as uh, the femme fatale side of things goes, they really, they try and we're, we're getting to it with the next movie. They try to do Fiona 2.0 and it just doesn't seem the same. Uh, right. But she is fantastic. She is one of the sexiest out of the Bond uh, vi- uh, villainesses too. And of course, I mean, just in general, the women, of course, I like Paula. I like uh, Domino to where, you know, she's not the character with the the most amazing things in the world to do, but she's she's written as a kept woman. She's serving her purpose. But Domino's a thumbs up for me too. I like that she kills Largo. I like that she isn't dumb. We're going to get into some in the future that are in a similar way, but they're just kind of dumb and ditzy. I don't really like that all that much, and she's not. I don't like that they're going to get dumber as we go along. Just... They're going to get better, and they're, and they're going to get worse. That's the thing. Yeah, I thought she was great. Obviously, incredibly, like, incredibly beautiful woman. She, You can learn a lot more about her than some of the other like Bond girls that you've gone through um, like before. She gets a lot more screen time. She's part of it from basically like three quarters of the movie in. She's involved in it in some form or fashion, so... So yeah, big thumbs up on Domino. It's a major thumbs up on all of the girls for me. I think this is, of the ones that we've reviewed thus far, this has been the best collection of Bond girls. Yep. And Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it doesn't stick that trend. (laughs) It takes a little while before we get another really good one, I think. Uh, But, you know, opinions may vary. Um, You you need need the bad ones to make the good ones stand out. Yeah. I will say, like, I I personally, uh, a lot of people disagree with me on this one. I don't think we get another good uh, Bond girl. Well, I mean, good. It, we, we get good Bond girls, but I don't think we get another great Bond girl for, let me see. You know, twice, three, 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 uh, Moonraker? <laughs> Maybe. That's quite so, like, like, five, six movies from now? There's one in the middle of there, and you can argue some of the other ones here and there, but I think that when you start analyzing them, they kind of fall apart. But um, we'll get to them when we get to them, obviously, because we got plenty more movies to go through. But uh, overall, shaken, not stirred. How you feeling? Shaken. Yeah, double shaken. Well, let's make it a triple. Uh, I am not the biggest fan of Thunderball on this franchise, but it's if you're grading on a scale, that's where it goes. Thunderball's on the lower end for me like right now and then there's much worse that makes Thunderball much higher on my list and I think that I have it somewhere in like that C tier type of range where they each individual movie has elements that are far better and far worse and there are some movies that are just overall much better and overall much worse so shaking for me uh, I will still go rewatch Thunderball a lot quicker than I will go rewatch Dr. No. Um, but yeah. Uh, any other thoughts you guys got? I'm optimistic about the direction of the franchise, but you've also <laughs> already told me that it gets worse from here. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to maybe a movie slightly but down the line which doesn't have to constantly evolve rubber and atomic weapons but we'll, we'll we'll see when that eventually happens when that break point comes what if we get to diamonds are forever that one is probably going to be There's only a few more movies from that we still have to get through um her majesty's secret service before we get to that so yeah we um i'll put it this way uh our next film is a case study in quite a bit of racism <laughs> <laughs> oh god oh, yeah. yeah here we go it's not the wow. last it's not go. the last time because no. uh once we get into the first roger moore one that that harps in uh, quite a bit but um the next one is uh there there's a lot of good in it and there's a lot of real bad and then we get into on her majesty's secret service which is one of my least favorite ones but it's a lot of people's favorite so that's the one more than any that I'm really interested in going back and rechecking out just to see if it maybe holds up differently now that I've aged. And then we get into Diamonds Are Forever, which is off the rails fucking bonkers. I think <laughs> I'm going to love that one. 
at the very least, we got a lot of discussion points of these next uh these next four, if not five, are really weird. <laughs> like if you weren't digging from Russia with Love because it was a little too stale, maybe, or you know, you wanted a little bit more of like the wacky type stuff or whatever, these next five a little bit less with Honor Majesty Secret Service. Uh these next ones are a fucking trip. <laughs> so um you know, strap yourselves in for this ride everybody cuz we're going to start abducting uh, rockets and we're going to have uh, hundreds of ninjas <laughs> a lot of weird stuff going on in the next one cuz uh this is going to carry on here. Before we go uh wrap things up entirely though, let's uh, round out our plugs. I mentioned before, if you want us to do more of these things, then hit up the Patreon. Check out everything else that's happening on fanboysanonymous.com. I don't know what uh, when I'm going to post this one. It's somewhere in February. We're recording it on January 24th, so that gives you an indicator of how far along this is. But um, everything else that's happening, it'll be on fanboysanonymous.com. Anything on the pro wrestling side of things is on smartoutmoment.com. So show some love over there if you're interested in the pro wrestling stuff. And these guys have plenty that they're working on with the pro wrestling stuff as well. Callum in particular does another podcast that we do here, and it's the Paul Heyman Smackdown podcast. Yeah, so anyone who's interested in a bit of retro wrestling, we can go, we, me and Rob go back to the year. 2002 and 2003 and check out all of the episodes of SmackDown that Paul Heyman was the head writer for. Um, and the one we've got coming, obviously we've just done the one uh, this past Saturday. I say this past Saturday. I don't know when this is going out. But we no, put out episodes every single out, Saturday. We'll rounding out the Paul Heyman SmackDown podcast. Yeah, we'll be pretty much, we're pretty close to the end at this point. But um, but yeah, we'll see when it comes out. Obviously, you can obviously go check it back in the archive if it hasn't already done. And me and Rob might be on to a completely separate project by this point. But Definitely stay, t- stay tuned to all the stuff that we've got going on the Smart Cat Moment channel, whether it's just the three of us or it's just two of us at a time. There's plenty to listen to there. And obviously check out smartcatmoment.com for all the great articles that are on there on a weekly basis. And yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at weekmeister14. And yeah, that's it from me. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Dude Police. You can check out what I'm doing on the wrestling side of things. Currently, I work for both WrestleZone and Fightful. And... Hopefully that is still the case a month from now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm so glad we're doing all this stuff on Fanboys. Check out our Mulan review and watch along. Check out whatever we're doing for WandaVision because I know there will be more. Uh, just keep clicking around. Thank you for your support. And I'm going to give you back to Tony. And I will take good care of you. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know why I went in that direction. Yeah, gonna... I love, it. I love it. You, You're talking about that in the same way that Bond takes care of Pat. <laughs> I don't. I don't have any mint gloves, but I'll get one. It, it eases tension, but not Pat's. It's another line right there, and not mine. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we will continue this journey with one of the wackier kind of uh, ones because this uh, review to a kill is going to return in the next installment. You only live twice. <laughs>